Good afternoon and welcome. Uh, it's great to see so many people here. Uh, my name is Denise Hurd and I'm a professor in the School of Public Health and I'm also the Associate Director of the Haas Institute for Fair and Inclusive Society. And um, today's very exciting event is, um, it's, it's really a pleasure to be here and uh, an honor to be among these guests. So today's talk is on cultural capital systemic exclusion and bias in the lives of middle class women, a conversation. Uh, today's event is co-sponsored by the Center for Research on Social Change and the Haas Institute for a Fair and Inclusive Society, and it's part of our Research to Impact series. Uh, we'd also like to thank our co-sponsors, Gender and Women's Studies, American Culture Center, the Townsend Center, Sociology Department, Center for Race and Gender, and the School of Social Welfare. And now I have the distinct pleasure of introducing um, Professor Imani Allen, who will be our moderator for today's event. Uh, Imani is my colleague, who I'm very glad to work with. Uh, she received her doctorate from John Hopkins University, the Bloomberg School of Public Health. Uh, she's also a principal investigator of the African American Women's Heart and Health Study. Uh, the study examines the association between racism, stress, cardiovascular biomarkers and biological stress among black women in the Bay Area. Her research has included work on black men, stress and heart health, doctor-patient race concordance, the intersection of race, socioeconomic status, and gender on risk for psychological distress, disability outcomes, adult mortality and child health and development, racial segregation and racism stress and mental health outcomes. And I can say from uh, having watched Imani teach that she, her work is amazing and just really points out the, uh, the stressors that African American women experience and it's just, it's foundational. So um, Imani, if you would just come on up to the podium. So good afternoon everyone. Um, so this is not my talk. This is for <laughs> Tina and Dawn. But um, thank you so much, Professor Hurd, for that for that um, wonderful introduction. Um, and welcome this afternoon to everyone who's here for this very exciting and much anticipated talk um, featuring two professors, two um, amazing professors that have done stellar and very timely work related to the lived and social experiences of African-American women. Um, Professor Dawn Dow from the University of Maryland at College Park and Professor Tina Sachs from uh, Social Welfare here at UC Berkeley. <coughs> So before we get started, I'd like to ask everyone to just check, even if you think you already silenced your cell phone, silence your cell phones, turn the vibrator off, even if it's silenced, um, just so that we're not interrupted. Um, so again, thank you for coming to this talk, Cultural Capital, Systemic Exclusion and Bias in the Lives of Black Middle Class Women, a conversation. Um, what I'd like to do is start by just describing the format um, that we're going to take this afternoon. So at today's event, Professors Dow and Sachs will discuss their new books on African American women, Mothering While Black, Boundaries and Burdens of Middle Class Parenthood by Professor Don Dow, and Invisible Visits, Black Middle Class Women in the American Healthcare System by Dr. Sachs. And um, I just want to let everyone know, if you haven't seen it already, um, the books will be for sale, available in the foyer um, at the end of this talk. So you can feel free to purchase and take home with you um, Tina Sachs' book, Invisible Visits. And you can also get a signed copy of that while you're here. And in addition, you will be able to order and have delivered to you Don Dow's book, Mothering While Black. So I just want to encourage everyone to um, purchase those books, to get them signed, anticipate the delivery of Don Dow's book, Mother and Wild Black, and just to support this work um, that's really phenomenal and again, timely work on the lived and social experience of black women, um, middle class black women in particular. Um, so again, going back to the format, what we're going to do is start with 10 minutes of introductory remarks by Professors Dow and Sachs um, consecutively regarding each of their books. And then I will moderate an approximate 20 to 30 minute conversation um, between the two of them. At that point, I will open the floor and invite you to ask questions and there will be a mic circulating so that it really can be kind of more of a dialogue and conversation. 
Um, so with that, I would like to turn to introducing um, the speakers. But before I do that, I also want to announce a special program here at Berkeley, the Graduate Fellows Program, of which Don Dow is an alum, um, which provides training and support for graduate students researching social change in the United States. Due to budget cuts, unfortunately, we're having to turn to crowdfunding to raise money for the student stipends, and so we're also soliciting your support to help fund this very important um, program. So just I want to put that buzz out there and invite you to do that at the appointed time. And Deborah, is there going to be... There's a URL right there. So you can go to the URL right now, in fact, as we speak. I'm sure many of you have smartphones, um, or preferably before the end of tonight. If you could just consider and make a donation, that would be greatly appreciated. So moving on to introducing the speakers, Dawn Marie Dow is Assistant Professor of Sociology at the University of Maryland College Park, my alma mater. Um, she received her PhD in Sociology from UC Berkeley. And her research examines intersections of race, class, and gender within the context of the family, the workplace, educational settings, and the law, and how these intersections complicate long-standing debates regarding the relative influence of economic and cultural resources on the experiences and life trajectories of members of the expanding African-American middle and upper middle class. Tina Sachs is an assistant professor at UC Berkeley School of Social Welfare. Tina received her PhD in social work from the University of Chicago. Her fields of interest include racial inequities in health, social determinants of health, and poverty and inequality. Her work focuses on how macro structural forces, including structural discrimination and immigration, affect women's health. Her current work investigates the persistence of racial and gender discrimination in healthcare settings among racial and ethnic minorities who are poor. And one of the really exciting things about me for even being honored with moderating this talk is the focus of my own work among African American women across the socioeconomic spectrum. But really understanding how a lot of the work in the public health but across dif different disciplinary literatures focus on generally poor blacks and more wealthy whites, as if the corollary to each of those groups don't exist. And so I think it's really important to focus on what could be seen as a more advantaged group, given that they're in the middle class, but I think their work really highlights some of the challenges in sitting in an intersectional social location that is on the one hand a position of privilege compared to, say, African American poor, or really um, poor people of color in general, um, but at the same time sitting also in um, really being attributed with a social identity that is very marginalized and stigmatized in our society, that being African American. And so I'm really looking forward to hearing more. I was really energized by reading both of these books over the last couple of weeks, and so you have a lot to look forward to. Um, so I would like to invite both of our speakers, Professor Dow and Professor Sachs, to come join us at the front. And Professor Dow, I will ask you to start with your opening remarks, um, followed by Professor Sachs. Thank you. One second, my alma mater. Um, it's kind of a homecoming. When I think about this book project, as I talk to you, I feel like a lot of it's um, uh, like a baby, a lot of its essential organs were formed while I was here. Um, I'm glad I was eating my prenatal bat vitamins, book vitamins or whatever. Um, I also wanted to uh, thank the co-sponsors, Haas Institute for Fair and Inclusive Society and Center for Research on Social Change for sponsoring this event, and for ISSI for, for thinking about bringing me back as, as a former fellow. Um, I wanted to particularly thank uh, Deborah Lustig and Sherry Sollers for coordinating my visit. Um, and thank all of you for being here today, because you have a lot of things you can do with your time, so the fact that you decided to show up to, to hear this talk means a lot to me. Um, so I thought I'd start up today by explaining um, how I became interested in this research and also talk a bit about um, the first chapter of the book to sort of motivate the conversation. But I should say that I'm happy to talk about any chapter or any part of the book that you would like to talk about, but I just thought the first chapter would sort of get us into a space where we could talk about the complexities of race, class, and gender as they pertain to black middle class and black middle class moms in particular. Um, so I became interested in this research in part because I was annoyed. 
Um, I was annoyed by a literature that I felt um, uh, often talked about middle class families and focused on the similarities that were bet the, between them, but often even in discussions of those families would note that there were complications related to both race and gender. Um, and oftentimes in both public and um, academic discourse, you would see a very consistent aside that was, oh, this is how black, white, uh, middle class families are without noting that they're talking primarily about white middle class families and then as a caveat or carve out or footnote would say, but black women or black families seem to be doing something different. Um, okay, next, let's go back to the, um, to the, core, the core group. Um, I sort of, out of frustration from that, felt like, why don't we do a project that centers the experiences of black families and really fully explore uh, how race, class, and gender, um, how, how and when and if it complicates their experience. So that was sort of um, the beginning's mo motivation for the, for the research. And it, I, and it sort of, like I said, engaged with the uh, literature that tended to I would say flatten differences across um, socioeconomic <coughs> resources, so tended to focus on um, how, what, what is shared. And I think that's important. Those frameworks are important to talk about the ways that resources help to um, give people additional options in their lives and also shape how they think about parenting. That, that literature is absolutely important. But I also think that it's important to understand how those resources are complicated by the societal reception that families receive as they go out into the world in different packages. Um, and in our society, those packages that are important are things like race and gender. Um, so the book itself is actually divided into two parts. I also am going to give a little bit of an overview of the book before I dig into one chapter. Um, it's divided into two parts. The first part is really talking about um, parenting and talks about the parts of, uh, of the concerns that black middle class mothers had that were shared um, for, their, for their sons and their daughters. Um, and those shared concerns focus on things like racial comfort and wanting to make sure that when their kids went to school, went to extracurricular activities, went to um, uh, school, <laughs> um, that they had people like them at that, at, at their, in, in their environment, that they weren't alone. That, and, they, and there was a consistent sort of desire to um, manage the balance for their kids. They wanted to make sure that their kids... Um, uh, felt comfortable in a variety of, set, of settings. Um, and, there, and then there were also complications that were, I'll go into more detail that, d that dealt with issues of gender um, that varied for their sons versus their, their boys. But the first half is really set up to engage in this, this, this literature that talks about parenting and thinks about the ways that um, resources really dic dictate um, parenting practices and to sort of explain how race complicates that. The second half of the book is really focused on the experiences of work-family balance. Um, again, in the literature, I should say that, that this, this, this part of it also came from a, a sort of um, a set of asides that I saw in the literature where people said that black middle class, uh, or black women in general, were thinking differently about work and family, were making different decisions around childcare, making different decisions around um, uh, uh, um, uh, incorporating work into their lives. And so the second half of the book really focuses on um, the area of family work research that has primarily looked at white middle class families and not looked at how, for black women, their decisions around those issues have um, started off from a different history and a different set of uh, experiences with both laws, policies, um, and uh, um, uh, economic resources in their families. All right, um, so the book is based on 60 in-depth interviews from the Bay Area. Um, I should say, in terms of giving a little bit of a, 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 a knowledge about the sample, it, they're mostly married mothers, um, just been for ages 25 to 49. Um, most had advanced degrees, and I focused on mothers primarily because literature suggested they are the individuals that are um, primarily socializing kids, even in today's world where we are starting to see different kinds of family configurations. But also black mothers in particular are primarily responsible for racial socialization of their kids. Um, and I also looked at middle class families in part because you would think that they have more, they have more resources financially to be able to contend with some of these issues. Um, 
Um, so trying to understand what, how, how race complicates those decisions, even in the, in the context of having resources, was something I was interested in exploring. So I want to talk a little bit about the, the shared concerns. As I said before, mothers had shared concerns for their, for their sons and daughters. They expressed being concerns for their uh, children's racial comfort and their academic and extracurricular activities. Um, and that played out in a, a variety of ways. Um, so statements like, um, I'm not going to send my kid to a school that is all white or a neighborhood that was idyllic but did not have enough black people in it for someone's taste signaled that they did not want their children to be racially isolated. And the time that mothers spent searching for schools to balance racial diversity with academic achievement and the diversity in their children's activities, and the time they spent traveling to other neighborhoods to expose their children to more African American mothers, and coordinating and enrolling same race friends in activities were examples of the, the sort of invisible labor that many mothers engaged in to accomplish this goal of racial comfort. And mothers also looked for something that I called racial intelligence in the book which is the idea that the people who were teachers or caregivers or leaders of extracurricular activities could also um, easily talk about things like race and racism. And if it came up in the school setting, that they could address it um, or were willing to tackle those issues. And they talked about the work involved in that. Now, mothers' concerns also differed, as I said before, for their sons versus their daughters. And I would say that when I was doing this research, um, it was really um, bookended by two events. Um, Oscar Grant and Trayvon Martin. And those two events really animated the concerns of mothers in different ways. So, and, and the gendered and racialized context for mothers' experiences were very different. Um, so you can imagine having the, the, the research book in the by those two, is of two events. Uh, what played out in interviews is mothers were um, very concerned for their son's safety and concerned that they would be criminalized and viewed as thugs. I should say, I, I highlight those two events, but if we think about the last few years and many, many years, it's not as if I couldn't pick two other events to bookend the, the experiences of these mothers. Um, and we know from you know, research about framing that the, the events around young black boys being um, uh, shot and killed by police officers and people in the general public um, tend to resonate more with people. Um, this is not to say that um, there aren't uh, concerns, for example, say her name, to, uh, Kimberly Crenshaw's initiative to talk about the experiences of young black women and young, and young black girls aren't, aren't also an issue, but that's not something that came up in the interviews. People talked about their sons when they talked about safety and physical and being criminalized. Um, now for their daughters, um, mothers were really concerned about self-esteem and self-value. And um, despite the fact that they recognized that, this, that the context was sort of different from when they grew up, when they couldn't really find books that had pictures had people in them that looked like them or didn't see as many images on television of themselves. They also noted that most of the images they saw were not great for black, for, for black girls. Um, at the same time, they also noted that this, ha this happened during a time frame when we have Michelle Obama, who's the first uh, black first lady. Um, there was a viral um, video that was going around called I Love My Hair by Sesame Street. I don't know if any of you saw it. You should search it up on the internet if you haven't. But it was trying to encourage young black girls to be happy about their hair and all its natural forms. Um, the Princess Frog came out, and many mothers commented on this, that having an opportunity to, to you know, see Disney portray a black female princess, although there were some controversies about what the meaning of that, all that was, and the, the portraying it properly. But these were things that informed the context. At the same time, those were isolated images. Sorry, I'm like shaking this over here. Isolated <laughs> images from the media that um, they felt they had to spend a lot of time count, using to counter the abundance of negative images they felt like their, their, their daughters were confronting. And I should say that they did this um, for their sons and different daughters differently. For their sons, they used uh, strategies that I call environment and um, experience management. And environment management was really geared towards trying to protect um, their sons from any experiences with racism. And, trying to vet out spaces to ensure that the people who were there um, were going to be supportive and um, cultivate a sense of pride and not damage their son's spirit. Um, and for experience management, it meant trying to put their child in, its, in, in situations where they um, could learn by talking to other black men about how to be black men in society, how to navigate um, the space as a black man successfully. For their daughters, they focus primarily on peer group management. So oftentimes, mothers would talk about trying to make sure that their daughters 
had a, a solid group of friends who looked like them, who would validate their self-worth, who when they were being you know, teased or called something negative on the school playground or had their hair made fun of, that they had a sort of collection of young black female friends who looked like them, who would support them, and um, who would validate their experience. Um, for their sons, in terms of their appearance, um, they also focused on um, uh, this idea of managing one's emotions and managing one's image. So for sons, um, one of the mothers talked about, you know, I, you know the, the, the son said, um, I'm just wearing a hoodie. She goes, I know that. I know that, baby. You're just wearing a hoodie. But in the neighborhood that we live in, the school that we're around, people see something different. And she says, is it fair? No. But is it what's real reality? Yes. And mothers felt very conflicted about this, right? So they knew that there was a double standard that they were teaching their, their children, and in some ways reproducing this idea that you have to act differently to be treated with the same sort of respect. But they also wanted their sons to come home alive, right? So um, people talked about that conflict that, you know, you're, my son can't do the same thing that a white boy can do and not have the same kind of response. And for their sons, they also cared about, you know, f you know physical appearance, like how they dressed and how they wore their hair. Um, now, mothers did at times talk about this in relationship to their daughters as well, but the weight was very different. So um, one mother talked about trying to streamline her morning routine, and she was debating getting cornrows for her daughter. And she was concerned because she thought, if I get cornrows, sometimes that's associated with a sort of class status. And, and she had that this deep size, so it was really important for me that they that didn't look ghetto, right? Because she was concerned that because of her daughter's hairstyle, even though she was attending a private school, that daughter would be stigmatized in some way, right? But you can see that the dis distinction, that, 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 and this is by no means to diminish the concerns that the mothers had. One concern was related to um, the physical safety, and the other was concerned with stigmatizing their, their, their child, their daughter. So they felt as though those concerns were more manageable. Okay. Um, lastly, for daughters, mothers often talked about something that they called, um, that, I, that I call, toy or, 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 or media management. They felt as though their daughters were um, like sort of presented with an onslaught of negative images of African Americans. Uh, they also talk about the fact that when they were growing up, they couldn't go into a Target or to a Toys R Us and find a Toys R Us even exist anymore. I don't know, um, but <laughs> no. no, okay. At, at the time, they did. <laughs> um, sorry, as an edit note self. But the, the Target, they could go in and get like a little stuffed princess that was brown, right? They could get uh, there were dolls that came in the right, you know, hair hair texture. Um, and that looked like their daughters. And this is something that you know, they would say, you know, if I see a, a, an image of a, if I see a, a book with a black girl in it, or I see a doll that's black, or I see um, a, a video that has a positive um, uh, image, I, I go and buy that for my daughter. And one mother talked about, you know, I really try to encourage Dora because, you know, she's a kid of color, she's traveling, uh, she's not a part of the whole Disney princess paradigm. Um, <laughs> And, and she would say, like, and people question me for talking about this with my five-year-old, right? But her view is that, well, if she's getting barraged with these images, I have to start to counteract them as early as possible. So she would have active conversations about why her child wasn't seen um, uh, as much. Um, versions of her child weren't on television in the same way other kids were. Uh, so those were the kinds of strategies that mothers use. Okay. And, um, I'm sorry, let me just get ahead a little bit. Um, so mothers believed that their children needed to learn how to navigate a broader white society that would stigmatize them based on their racial identity and gender, um, and that their class status did not provide protection for this. Um, that despite having resources, when they walked out into the world, that they were received um, as a black girl or a black boy, and that did not necessarily come with an assumption of being a good middle class kid. Mothers encourage their daughters to reject the negative media images and create their own ideals of black womanhood, kind of engaging in a version of what Patricia Hill Collins would call black feminist thought, where they sort of come to their own definitions about who they are and their well-felt worth. Um, 
uh, mothers encourage their um, sons uh, to, um, despite, the fact, despite the fact that their sons were boys, which we kind of tend to associate with strength and, um, and dominance, they felt like these, two, these categories made their sons vulnerable. Um, both of these processes meant that their children had to develop a double consciousness where they saw themselves through the broader society's eyes but created their own empowering self-image. Um, these mothers' labor, as I said before, is largely invisible. Although being middle class is typically associated with certain privileges, race and gender impact one's ability to reap the benefits of those privileges. Um, in response, the mothers use strategies to fortify their daughters against assaults on their self-esteem and protect their sons from attacks on their bodies. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much. That was so interesting, Don. Thank you for sharing that work. And there are a lot of commonalities and intersections between our work that we'll discuss in, a, in just a little bit. Um, and so just in the interest of time, I also want to thank the, the sponsors and co-sponsors of this event. And um, I'm just very excited to be here. Uh, because our time is short, I just want to make a couple of orienting remarks about the book, and particularly how I came to write it. Uh, the main takeaways of the book itself, and what I, you know, hopefully we can discuss what it means for our understanding about how race, class, and gender affect health more broadly. And not only among people who are middle class, but what it tells us about the persistence of race and gender discrimination in general. So as I described in the book, the kernel for it really began when I worked at the Centers for Disease Control um, and Prevention in Atlanta. I, was, um, I received my master's degree in um, social work and in health policy, and I, when I just went straight down to Atlanta, and it was, a, it was a great time because I was a fellow at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, and many of my colleagues were also black women who had advanced degrees, and we were all so excited essentially to embark on our first professional um, you know, postgraduate career uh, job. Um, so we would often talk about, we would get together, and Atlanta was, um, uh, I don't know if anyone here is from Atlanta. You're from Atlanta. <laughs> Atlanta's a very fun city. And um, we would often talk about the, um, our careers. We would get together over drinks and dinner and talk about our careers and just our experiences in the world as women, as black women with advanced degrees. And all of us were working at the Centers for Disease Control, so we certainly had a, a particular interest in health, obviously. At one of these dinners, a colleague told a story about how she purposely wore her CDC badge to the doctor for as long as she could before she would have to disrobe at the doctor's office. And she did this, you know, we all sort of chuckled as she told us about this because we didn't really even have to ask why she did that. It was sort of implicit why she did that. Later, as we discussed it further, though, it was clear that the reason that she did it and the reason that we all, we also did the same thing was to signal to the, to the healthcare provider a few things. One, that we had particular healthcare, a kind of healthcare literacy, a health literacy. Um, the CDC is a very large employer in Atlanta, and so everyone in Atlanta essentially knows what the Centers for Disease Control is. Um, and so it, ha it carries with it a certain connotation um, that you have, perhaps have an advanced degree, that you have some kind of health, particular health knowledge, that you have, quote unquote, a good government job, um, and that you um, that you are a person, and just to some extent, um, to be taken seriously. And so that kind of, that experience, although it was before I embarked on my graduate, my, my doctoral degree, it really laid the, the foundation for me to think about why is it that we are doing this? What is the sort of implicit assumption that we, we feel we need to do this when we go to the doctor, because there is an implicit assumption, um, similar to what you described, Dom, that, um, that our class status didn't necessarily protect us from the stereotypes that we faced or the stigma that we faced as we went to the doctor. And so as I embarked on my doctoral work in, uh, I wanted to explore more about the, um, the causes and consequences of, of health, um, health disparities or health inequity, though that experience in Atlanta really stayed with me. Uh, and so 
I when I obviously I am a social worker and a social welfare scholar. I'm very concerned about people who are poor and the most vulnerable among us. And as I embarked on my doctoral work, I um, was looking at people who are very poor and the relationship between poverty and health. But also, like Don, I found myself becoming very frustrated by the research literature in which um, I, I found, you know, that, that empirically it is true that, that black people who are middle class um, tend to have worse outcomes than similar white, um, similar white people, um, tend to live sicker and die younger. And yet, there was very little in the research literature about this. And so I decided to um, conduct interviews as I embarked on my research, my dissertation research. I decided to actually talk to women about their experiences in healthcare, um, going to the doctor. So I interviewed women in Chicago, um, 30 women. I conducted focus groups and interviews with women there. And I was really interested in what I, what I was hoping to see some, some intra-racial variation in terms of women's experiences going to the doctor. So I interviewed women who might be considered um, lower middle class compared to women who might be considered upper middle class to see if the lived experience of this class status really affected them when they went to the doctor. Um, I won't get into some of the challenges of that methodologically in terms of operationalizing lower middle class compared to upper middle class. <laughs> Uh, but that is something that perhaps you would you would ask me offline. I can tell you. <laughs> um, so at any rate, I, I talked to women about their experiences, and what I found was um, really sort of a persistent sense of that they would be stigmatized, that they would face some forms of discrimination in the healthcare encounter, and that. They really struggled more, more sort of in, in, a, in a grander sense, in a broader sense, I should say, to be taken seriously, to be considered credible witnesses to their own health care condition. Essentially, as a person who is living in the body um, that goes to the doctor, and yet oftentimes they felt that the, their health care providers did not necessarily take them seriously. And, and importantly, they did feel that this was related both to their race and their gender. And so clearly there's an intersectional story to be told here. Um, so in the book, I describe their experiences with um, what um, many scholars, and particularly Moya Bailey describes as misogynoir, or the particular kind of anti-black sexism that black women face. And the, the stereotypes that black women um, encountered as they um, dealt with doctors. So the book is really about that writ large and the, the modifications that many of these women made to their own kind of self-presentation. They tried to emphasize certain elements of their own resources, given that they were, they were middle class, um, to try to do research before they went to the doctor, to talk to the doctor about what they thought the doctor would be interested in. Um, there, were, there was a lot of work, and again, I think one of the commonalities between our work is the invisible labor that many black women and many um, black people and other people of color experience going about our day-to-day -day lives in which in order to be taken seriously or viewed as credible, there is an enormous amount of work and, and self-presentation of modification of oneself um, that I, I argue in the book may take a toll on our health, right? Because this is really an additional burden that other people do not carry with them. Um, and so I, do I have time one? So one thing I wanted to do um, is just read just a, a short passage from the book, very short. Um, <laughs> very short, just to give you a little bit of a sense of what I'm talking about and then, then um, open it for discussion. So the, this, the woman that uh, I'm gonna read a story about is a, it was a 35 year old woman who I encountered um, during a focus group. She had an MBA. She ran her own consulting business and she described um, the words she used when she talked about going to the doctor. She said, I come in armed with information. Um, this was her way of trying to counteract what she saw as the really prevailing and, and dominant stereotypes of black women that she faced when she went to the encounter. So she describes a, a situation in which, um, she, uh, so I'll read from here, she says, as an undergraduate, um, Tracy began suffering from pain in her right knee. Eventually the pain began to interfere with her daily activities and she sought help from many phys physicians who ordered x-rays that turned up nothing. Tracy explained, quote, 
In undergraduate, I woke up one day and my knee was bothering me and I went to a doctor and they said nothing was wrong. And I went to another doctor and they did an x-ray and they said nothing was wrong. I would go for a year and I would go back to somebody else and they would tell me nothing was wrong. And then 15 years elapsed. Eventually, I went to a doctor and I said, look, it hurts so bad at night. The only way I can sleep through the night is to take Advil before going to bed. And he said, well, you'll just have to do that for the rest of your life. Half the time they were telling me it was because of my weight. They put me in physical therapy. They did all these things. And I was young and I still believed in the myth that doctors were infallible. Eventually what happens to Tracy, um, she eventually goes back and forth, she finally finds a provider who is willing to do an MRI of her knee, uh, which is a more sensitive diagnostic test. Um, and she, she says that um, this, this MRI yielded troubling results and she was told to come, to, to come back to the hospital immediately, quote. They called me and said, you need to come back. They set me up for surgery, and I had two tumors in my knee that had been growing for 15 years that nobody found. After the surgery, I was out of work for two months. I was in physical therapy for nine months because of what they did. And as the doctor explained to me, had the tumors been malignant, they would have had to amputate my leg. So this is an example, I think. Um, certainly this is one woman's story. But this is an example in which a woman is trying to essentially advocate for herself at the doctor. Um, she goes back and forth for 15 years, insisting that there is something wrong, and they essentially tell her that this is just because you're essentially a fat black woman. And these kinds of um, these are the kinds of experiences that I wanted to draw out of invisible visits to render these stories visible um, and to make us understand that. This takes a toll, obviously, that there are real consequences to not being believed. And um, I think it has implications for how we think about race, class, and gender um, for many different outcomes, but in this case, certainly for our own health. Thank you. Thank you both for, um, for those opening remarks. I have, my pa paper is littered, I already had written remarks and my paper is littered with red ink <laughs> from all the things that we could sit here and talk about. We obviously don't have time for all of them, but um, there are a few kind of themes that I think are common between these two books as, you know, some of you may have read these books, some of you may not have, but even if you haven't, you probably could hear the similarity in some of the themes. And so I just want to highlight a few of those, um, and obviously, first and foremost, is this idea of intersectionality between race, class, and gender. Um, and one of the takeaway messages, I guess, for me is, you know, thinking about, and so I work in the field of social epidemiology and in class, um, several social epi students are in, the, um, are in the audience right now, and we talk a lot about this concept of flexible resources and this idea about how because of the resources that certain groups disproportionately have, they're able to utilize those resources through free choice to engage in activities that they know are gonna garner better health, right? So using knowledge, money, power, prestige, beneficial social connections, all of the kind of tangible and intangible resources that we know are health promoting. And while we would like to imagine that middle class Americans, I mean, if we took a survey, we would probably all say we're middle class, right? It's one of the problems. As middle class Americans, you know, the assumption is that you have enough for subsistence, for subsistence. You have enough to put food on your table, you have shelter, and even enough to not just meet your needs, but to get a little more than what you actually need just to live day to day. And the issue with, I think, black middle class and upper middle class women is that, as you were saying, Don, race complicates their ability to utilize their resources. So actually, what should be flexible resources are not so flexible, right? They have the resources, but they, they're not so flexible and are unable to reap the benefits 
of their class position. And we were just talking in class yesterday about status and consistency and the distress that can really come from having attained a certain level of socioeconomic position but not really being able to realize those benefits because of the marginalized social status of, African, of being African American. And so I think this, this idea of kind of how, and I think, um, I don't remember now because I've been reading both of your books, um, Don, I think this might be um, from your book. You said that African Americans' access to middle class privilege is mediated through their race and their race, their gender, and their identity, or their race and their gender identity. And I think that's a really important concept. That regardless of whether we're talking about intersections with the healthcare system and being able to achieve the objectives um, of those visits, right? or parenting and engaging in, in networking and really being able to flexibly use those resources to belong and to provide the kinds of opportunities that we all want to provide for our kids, that those are all challenges. So I think that's one obvious takeaway from both of your books. The other one is this idea of invisible labor. Um, so as you all were talking, so when I think about invisible labor in both of your books, you talk about the concept and you call it different things. John, in your book, you call it shifting. Um, Tina, you talked about impression management. Many will be familiar with the concept of code switching. Um, and I can code switch with the best of them. And I was sitting there and, you know, in my own work, you know, I do both quantitative and qualitative work, but as, as you were sitting here, and so I've heard women talk about African American women across the socioeconomic spectrum very commonly talk about on a day-to-day -day basis how they have to code switch, kind of come in and out of different communities, kind of engage in this kind of um, enactment of the public self, I think you talked about in your book, um, and how burdensome that it is to have to perform every day. And as you were sitting there um, talking, I was sitting in my seat and recalling a time where I went to the doctor. And you know, at, at UC Berkeley, I'm known as Professor Allen now, um, <laughs> but when I go to Smart and Final, that's not how I'm seen. When I go to the mall, that's not how I'm seen. When I go to the doctor, when I go anywhere else I go in my life, that is not how I'm seen. And I was sitting there recalling a time where I was sitting at the doctor and sitting there, no one else was in the waiting room. And I was invisible. No one asked to help me. And after sitting there for a period of time, I texted my brother and I said, call me. And so he called me, and I did that just so I could answer the phone and say, Dr. Nuru Jeter, can I help you? <laughs> it was such a farce that I got immediate attention after that. Why do I have to be a doctor in order for you to see me? And there are so many experiences that probably if we went around the room, we would hear, right? So this idea of enacting the public self and having to perform and what that really means in terms of, so I do a lot of work on the psychobiology of stress related to the experience of racism and sexism and the intersection of race, class, and gender and the toll that just that performance takes on our health, but also again on the resource, resources when we think about parenting. Um, I saw, I looked out into the audience and I saw um, Chris, one of my students from social epidemiology, and I remember um, I didn't know that my students were going to be bowling when Professor Francis invited me to go bowling with her. But I walked into the bowling alley with my gym clothes and a do-rag on um, and had my son with me. Um, and as soon as we walked in and I saw people, I said, take that do-rag off. Because he is a young black man and he had on a hoodie and he had on a do-rag and I knew that I was going to be in the presence of non-black folks that were probably going to stereotype and judge him and I'm not talking about you Chris but just in general <laughs> the awareness that there that that we would both be othered in that space and and you were just talking about how sometimes it's such an off-the-cuff reaction we don't even think about how that how did that socialize him right not being able to just be his normal self he's trying to get waves so we want to try to that. And I messed up his ability to make ways because I didn't want him to be stereotyped at the bowling alley. But it's a, it's a serious issue, right? And so, you know, we can think about it from the perspective of stress, but we can also just think about it from the perspective of what kind of social messages, messages that we're giving our children and all those around us to have to be somebody different, just to be accepted. So um, that's another, I think, theme. And then... The last thing that I wanted to mention, there are others, is this concept of being a superwoman. 
and having to navigate this space through the intersection of race, class, and gender. And you know, I do work on this concept of the strong black woman or superwoman syndrome or superwoman schema in my own work. And, and while, while in my own qualitative work, black women talk about how being a strong black woman is an asset. It is something that they use intentionally in order to navigate a race conscious and gender conscious society. And how they see it as an asset, however, the question becomes, what is the cost of coping? So while women will say, this is what I do, this is what helps me get through the day to day, when we actually study it quantitatively, what we actually find is that it's actually very damaging to health. And, and so superwoman schema, for those who are less familiar, there are various scales that tap into this construct of the strong black woman. One of the scales that I use in my work is superwoman schema. And many of these scales are these kind of multi-dimensional scales that tap into various ways that black women see themselves in relation to the world. And um, some of these orientations include things like feeling an obligation to manifest a presence of strength even when one doesn't feel strong, feel an obligation to suppress emotions, feeling this very um, intense desire to resist being seen as dependent or vulnerable, um, having an intense motivation to succeed despite limited resources, so those inflexible resources that I was talking about before, um, and a variety of other things. And one of the things that we're finding in my work is, in our work, um, based on data from the African American Women's Heart and Health Study, are that some of these, some dimensions of, super, of being a strong black woman are protective, but some of them are very damaging. And we're finding in our own work that things like having an intense motivation to succeed and um, feeling this obligation to nurture and take care of others while neglecting your own self-care is actually related to um, heightened levels of, of allostatic load. Allostatic load, for those who are less familiar, is a composite measure of a variety of different biological indicators that, um, that kind of convey how well the body is functioning across multiple systems, the metabolic system, the immune system, the um, neuroendocrine system, the cardiovascular system, right? And so this kind of measure of multi-system physiologic dysregulation. And having higher levels of allostatic load then leaves you more susceptible to a variety of poor health outcomes. It's been associated with mortality, but also a host of chronic diseases. And so we're finding that that enactment of being that strong black wo woman in various contexts is actually associated with dysregulated physiology, dysregulating our physiology, especially in the context of chronic experiences of racial discrimination, right? And so, so that's problematic, right? And so both of you in your work kind of talk about this need to be strong, this need to figure out how to navigate a race and class and gender conscious society and not really be able to utilize those resources. And so, you know, that question comes back to me about what is the cost of coping? Um, so none of that is a question. Those are just kind of... <laughs> 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 this is supposed to be QA. Um, these are just comments, but these are some of the things that really resonated with me in your two books. So I guess, you know, one question that I have is, what do you want to see happen as a result of, so one of the things I believe I've noticed, if I'm not mistaken, is that both of these books are with popular presses, not academic presses, is that right? They're both, They're both academic presses. Okay, well they are written in a very, in, in a very digestible way for kind of popular audiences as well as academics. And so I guess my question is, and highlighting these experiences, experiences that we don't hear about on the 10 o'clock news, what do you want to see happen as a result of this work? You, I would first mention. We had to speak to trade. Thank you. <laughs> so what I would like to see is a, a, a few a few things. One, I really think that that an actual reckoning with these underlying structural forms of discrimination needs to take place. And so what I mean by that is, I do feel like sort of in the, in the, in the health, sort of in social work and in public health, we have, already, we have closed around the idea of implicit bias as being the driver of healthcare inequality. I think that many of, many of these biases are quite explicit. Um, 
And I think that to, to actually acknowledge that is important. And one of the things I, I talk about in the, or I explore in the book that I, I do not have enough data to really explore um, in great depth, but is, is that the, the way medic, medical providers are trained oftentimes, oftentimes is highly racialized. So medical training, it, it's, not, it's no surprise that we have differences in treatment, that they're manifest in the healthcare system. Because even, uh, you know, a, a couple of years ago, some medical students in Virginia were, there was a study of medical students in Virginia, and they believe that black people are fundamentally biologically different, have um, different, thicker, thicker skin, which makes, um, supposedly makes black people um, impervious to pain. And then we, of course, see great discrepancy, great disparities in pain management in this country. This is no, there's nothing surprising or implicit about any of this. So that's one thing I would like to see, is an actual acknowledgement that much of this is um, something that's sort of built in, it's baked into the cake, essentially, of this country. It is structural and it needs to be reckoned with on its face as opposed to sort of through the back door of thinking about unconscious bias training. So that, that's one thing. Um, that's a great one thing. <laughs> um, I, I think that part of what I'm trying to do with my, my, my research is to sort of highlight the fact that society matters. We tend to sort of think about these issues as being individual or group-centered issues. So looking at black middle-class mothers and the challenges they have with their families and what can we do to help them be better at it. But a lot of Part of what I'm trying to do in the book is to sort of underscore that we have to take what society, how our society receives certain families differently seriously, right? And sort of build on this idea that it's not, this is about structural issues. It's not just about individual-oriented um, challenges. Um, so that's one thing I would say. I have to say, I have to say thank you for saying that the book was written accessibly because one of the best um, things that has happened to me in, in writing the book and also articles related to the book is that I've been uh, gratified when people have emailed me or come up to me and said, um, we took this book and we have this article that you read and we were talking about it in our mother's group, mm -hmm. right? And sometimes those mother's groups are of black women and sometimes those mother's groups are a, a, a group of white women talking about the challenge like, trying to educate themselves about something outside of themselves. And so that's made me feel good, that it's gotten people to have conversations and to join in community with each other um, about uh, the challenges that they're facing. Um, I also um, uh, think that the book that I've written has been, um, has the potential to help people understand the concerns that black middle class moms or black people have when they're sending their kids out into the world. I mean, when we think about middle class resources, we tend to think about um, that means you have a great neighborhood, that means you have access to teachers that are really supportive and, and love your kid, or a uh, community that is safe. And these mothers were very anxious about sending their kids out into the world. They were not sure that, that sending their kid into the world was going to mean that they were going to be received in a positive way. And I think that there's a way that sharing this information with the kinds of places that they're, that, 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 with the places that they're sending their kids to, so uh, schools, police departments, um, if there's a way that I could send this to extracurricular activity leaders <laughs> um, that are brought, because I mean, sometimes mothers are making these decisions about you know, I want my kid to go to this uh, particular dance school, but they're going to be isolated in that environment and, and don't want to have their child be in that kind of space. Um, so I think that the, I, I would hope that the book becomes something that um, helps to guide some uh, discussions around sensitivity around those issues, but also makes institutions think about why these mothers have these concerns to sort of think about restructuring themselves or becoming more sensitive to the issues on a more systematic level. Mm -hmm. And I also want to give you all a chance to um, ask each other questions. If there were if there were any questions that you had, Tina, for example, in relation to Don, your book, or Don, if you had questions for Tina, um, because I could ask questions all day long. <laughs> well, a question I had for Tina, 
Am I off my? Can you guys hear me? Yeah. I think it's off. But, no. It's on. It's on now. Is it on now? Yeah. Okay, yes. great, thank you. A question I had for Tina, which I mean, I when I read your book, I felt like there were these little daggers that were stabbing me in the heart because I was like, I do that. I do that too. Um, so, and you talk about this in, in um, you talk about this a little bit in your comments, but I was curious about the the various strategies that, that, that people use to try to be seen in the way that they felt they should be seen by these doctors. You talk a little bit about wearing a badge, but I just feel like there's, I just wanted to talk more about what, what people are doing to try to be seen as fully human. Sure. So one of the things that women talked about was that the, the work they did prior to the encounter. So this, this was a lot of it. Um, and this was women doing a lot of research on their own, um, not just on Google, but just um, really trying to understand what their healthcare condition was, what the, the sort of the range of appropriate treatment might be for whatever they had, um, because they, they really felt they needed to be um, credible to the physician and also to know what was possible because they feared that perhaps they wouldn't get the full range of what was possible. And that is actually empirically true that black people tend not to get sort of the, full, the, the gold standard of medical treatment. So that was one thing. So there was sort of a, a work that went on before even walking into the door. Um, once they got to the encounter, they would deploy that research. And so really took great care with the language that they used. And so the, 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 the story that I read from the book, um, the woman described walking in with ar armed with information but purposely using words that she said that she said when when I use words you know you read in a book somewhere it's all different mm -hmm. so she talked about very purposely deploying a certain kind of vocabulary once she got once they got into the healthcare um, the healthcare space and also people talked a lot about how they dressed very similar to what you were talking about Imani about how you look when you go out and about so they talked about just feeling like they had to, to wear certain clothing, not necessarily wanting to wear their gym clothes. I mean, and, and granted, now this is in Chicago. This is a different kind of space than in California, um, in which people are more formal in general, I would say. So that I think there, there are some regional differences there. But um, that was another thing that people would do um, to try to get the provider to um, treat them a certain way. And then also that you know the idea of a of sort of a cultural health capital, these resources that people brought into the encounter. One thing that the idea of cultural health capital, the, this kind of concept suggests is that, and has been borne out empirically, is that physicians expect people to be able to tell them very succinctly, these are my concerns. They also expect people to be able to have kind of a, um, take an instrumental approach to one, to their own body. So they can discipline their own body through taking their, their medication as they're supposed to, doing the exercise they're supposed to, following through on whatever kind of treatment um, the, the provider suggests. And women also felt they needed to signal that to them as well, that they're going to be a compliant um, patient. Have you ever thought about or know of any work that, so, I mean, the work that you were doing was in relation to, or from the perspective of black middle class women themselves. And I'm curious about what work is out there that may either um, confirm that these are valid fears that black women have because this is in fact the way the doctors think. I mean, because I hear you saying that, you know, doctors kind of expect people to come in and really take an active role in, in their kind of healthcare experience. At the same time, I've seen some literature that kind of talks about the biases that physicians have um, in terms of their perspectives about um, compliance with treatment, et cetera, and how these biases impact the treatment decisions that they make. So I'm just curious about kind of this, I guess, intersection between physicians or providers wanting their patients to come in armed with a certain amount of knowledge and the extent to which that may vary depending on who those patients are. And are there situations where they go from kind of a more participatory decision-making style, engaging with the patient to a more kind of authoritative decision-making style while not offering 
all of the available options. I know I've certainly been in that position before, and when I'm in a doctor's office, and I say, well, why are you suggesting this over these other three options? Mm -hmm. And there's really no good answer, right? And then I start to ask, well, can, what are the studies that demonstrate, and they're like, <laughs> <laughs> Right, but you should be able to tell me that as, as a healthcare provider. And so I'm just curious, like from the perspective of the provider, mm -hmm. do we know what they're looking for or how they code switch? So, so there is some literature to suggest that, um, again, that it's intersectional, right? So that when certain people come in and they say they're, they're very, they take this instrumental approach that it's fine by the physician. But with racial, ethnic <coughs> racial minorities, it's, it's sometimes um, perceived as being too aggressive. Mm -hmm. um, so that there is, so, and this sort of goes into these tropes about um, being an angry black woman, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So that there is some evidence to suggest that as well. And, and the women um, that I spoke to actually said that oftentimes. They would say, you know, I, I, I really feel like I have to uh, walk a very fine line here by indicating that I know X, Y, and Z, but not ever sort of stepping on the authority of the, of the provider. And um, Tina, do you have any questions for, for Dr. Lots of questions. <laughs> I'm sorry, many of them have already been answered. So yeah. All right, that's fine. Yes, that's fine. I'm um, glad I answered your question. And I just wanted to give them a chance to dialogue with one another, but after this, we'll open it up for um, audience QA. I think, you know, because of my work is, is I'm concerned about stereotyping and its effect on people. I wonder if women in your sample talked about this particular trope that's often levied against black women about this non-marital fertility, about um, hypersexuality and the ways in which black women have been um, viewed, and if that played into their their own conceptualization of, of motherhood and of black motherhood in particular. Um, so that wasn't a sort of key part of the, 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 the interviews that I did, but I mean, mothers certainly did try to present themselves in a respectable way. They were concerned about um, people thinking of them as respectable black women um, and, and not being loose or wild. Mm -hmm. And what that meant was, you know, unmarried um, children with many fathers. And, and, and there are some mothers that sort of, their, the facts of their lives were that they were married, had been with multiple partners, and had children with those different partners. And so then tried to deploy their middle class status and settings to balance out that biography. Because they knew that, you know, life is complicated. You know, some people have very direct sort of um, career trajectories and some people have very direct romantic tra trajectories and some of the mothers had less direct romantic trajectories. Um, but they knew that there was a different kind of consequence for them having that narrative. So they would, you know, you know emphasize that they were a lawyer, emphasize their current marital status, um, uh, tr dress in a certain way, talking about going to the doctors or to going to the uh, uh, a appointment with their child, that they wore suits when they went flying on planes, knowing that their kids may have different last names, that they would try to like, wear their suit as an armor. Um, so that was something that people talked about. Um, they also talked about it with respect to their daughters in terms of this desire to have self-esteem um, that uh, was uh, sort of a, a strong racial self-esteem and strong sense of value um, and trying to police how their daughters presented themselves because they also didn't want their children to be viewed as hypersexual and they knew that their daughters might be. Um, I would say that the controlling image that sort of came up the most for them um, was this sort of um, idea of a strong black woman. Um, and that was more in the, uh, related to the second half of the book when they were talking and talking about decisions related to work and family. Um, so this is something that's not a, 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 a new sort of discovery, but black women, for black women, they view, in, view working outside of a home as an important part of their identity and being self-reliant. On average, that's sort of the community expectation. Um, and 
even mothers who might not want to fulfill that expectation felt a tension if they decided to either decrease their hours. Um, mothers who stayed at home often talked about feeling like they had to justify that choice. So when we typically think about middle class families, we think about um, middle class white women feeling somewhat supported in the decision to stay at home and reduce their hours for work. Whereas for <coughs> black women, when they made that choice, there was kind of a sort of set of, this, of conflicts that were happening inside of them that were related to this idea of the strong black woman. And some people very explicitly rejected it, but they also knew it was a community standard that they had to negotiate. Mm -hmm. um, so I would say in terms of controlling images, and maybe this is mostly because we, I was talking about it in relationship to raising kids, the issues of the strong black woman came up a lot more mm -hmm. than um, thinking about <coughs> other, other stereotypes like the Jezebel, mm -hmm. which mm -hmm. connects more to sexual um, promiscuity or being a victim of some sort. Uh, well, thank you. So what I'd like to do now is open the floor for questions from you all, questions or comments from anyone who would like. Hello. Thank you so much. Uh, it's great to be here and to hear your insight. Uh, my question is for Dr. John. Oh. Ben? Yeah. Hold it up. Yeah. I don't hold microphone. Hi. I have to do it with my other hand. Um, so my question is for Dr. John. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. That's Dow, just Dow, Dow. like cow, <laughs> Dow chemical, <laughs> Dow corning. This is going so well. Oh, sorry. No, it's fine. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I'm used to I'm used to doing what people get. Yeah. It's fine. Um, so my question is, um, you touched on it a little bit during the presentation, and I think it's something that I've seen often in popular culture about sort of the um, assessment of when you want your children to go to a better school that may have less cultural diversity and sort of the impact and the balancing act that occurs between having a place, an educational environment where your child might be surrounded by people that look like them, but where there may be um, sort of less opportunities educationally and how that's sort of compared with the other um, aspect of greater educational opportunities but also an environment that's less diverse. And I was curious if in your research or in, uh, you encountered any sort of consistent response to if there was a factor that sort of led to one decision or the other. So I would say mothers made different choices. Um, I think in my sample, so I, in the book I talk about these sort of three categories of moms who have different sort of orientations to racial identity and class identity. And um, one group who um, I call the border crossers were folks who it was really important for their kids to maintain a connection to uh, black folks who were from all like walks of life, poor, privileged, middle class, um, and also able to navigate like white spaces as well. Um, and I would say that those mothers tended to sort of be, have it be a priority that their kids, they would balance out academic achievement in a way with their um, racial diversity. So they tended to sometimes, there might have been a school that would have been completely white or predominantly white, and they would have opted for a school that had less academic achievement and more diversity because they wanted to have their kids be in that space. Um, so they had uh, an ability to navigate. And mothers who were in that category who didn't do that would find other mechanisms to give their kids that exposure. They, whether that was dra driving to another community so that they would take tennis lessons on a, in a neighborhood that was like the ones that they grew up in so that they would feel comfortable interacting with their family members. Because this is often about not just uh, an abstract idea. It was an idea that, you know, I might be middle class, but my cousin or my sister might be working class, or might actually be in jail, or um, you know, might be struggling in some way. I might be actually sending them some some some, some support, but I want my kids to be in, around them and to not feel better than them, or like they're strange and be comfortable. And we might go back to that neighborhood, and I want them to walk to the park and not be afraid of the people they see on the way there. Um, so, folks who I think were tended to be more likely to pick sort of more predominantly white spaces. And they also had strategies for trying to get their kids the kind of exposure to the kinds of black people they wanted to expose them to as well. Um, uh, were more likely to pick schools that were, um, and, I say, and I say likely generally, because this was not a random sample. 
it was a snowball sample, but then it was, they tended to be more likely to put their kids into a school that had a higher white population, um, and, or that was predominantly white, or that they might be in an activity where they were the only white uh, black kid in that activity. But then again, they would try to balance that by either having church activities, or have they have groups that they have their kids interact with that have exposure to um, to to other black kids and. There was some, and I call that group of mothers um, border policers. Um, lots of borders here. Um, <laughs> and then the, there's another group that I think for them it was less about, um, it was more about having their kids in multiracial, interracial spaces that were predominantly middle class. And I call that group of mothers the border transcenders. And they tended to be folks who were um, either raised in really interracial environments, um, were married to non black People, and I say non-black because some of them were married to white people, some of them were married to non-black minority folks, some, and, and some people were married to non-black, non-Americans. And so their, their orientations towards race were just slightly different in terms of having a different paradigm for what it means to be a black person. And um, so they, had, they also wanted their kids, in all these categories, they wanted their kids to have some kind of connection to their cultural and racial identity. They, they took different approaches. So... Um, and in those cases, those mothers were actually prioritizing just diverse <coughs> educational spaces for their kids, and then um, would try to supplement the sort of additional cultural learning that they felt that they might not be getting um, in, uh, in other spaces. So there were definitely, so that was what I, what I would say is a loose pattern in terms of people being more comfortable having their kids in predominantly white spaces, but there was always a, a response, a kind of calculation, and sort of thinking, I've made this decision in one area, how am I going to try to balance it in another area? And sometimes they realized that they couldn't balance it. They had it in the back of their mind. It's like, oh, okay, well, I haven't balanced this. I, if I get a chance to balance this at some point, I want to. Or they would do other sorts of things to balance it, whether that was like, you know, in, um, increasing the kinds of cultural learning that they did or, you know, visiting family members out of state so they had that exposure elsewhere. There were strategies they were using to try to balance. Did I answer your question? Yeah. Okay. Should I wait for that? So in the back, and then we'll come over here to you. First of all, I'd like to uh, thank the uh, person who mentioned the thing about implicit bias. I think implicit bias is a black pundit class and uh, white term. Uh, it's always been pretty explicit to me and both blacks and the uh, lower economic classes. I just wanted to ask uh, a couple of questions. Uh, great question. Uh, Someone spoke about racial literacy, and I tend to doubt the ability of most white people in particular to truly have any racial literacy. And with regard to that, and say black women going to the doctor, should uh, white doctors perhaps have a racial checklist? Like, number one, am I taking her seriously? Number two, am I listening to what she's saying? Number three, am I offering alternative possibilities? Uh, that sort of thing. Um, my other thing is, when whoever was talking about um, black women, I guess, coping with their kids in white environments, perhaps predominantly white private schools, and you know, having them shy away from certain hairstyles or clothing styles or hoodies, whatever. Uh, one, I've never worn a hip hoodie, and I've gotten stopped for just about every kind of wild black you can imagine. Uh, two, I have a housemate who's, uh, one of my housemates is white female housemates, who was accepted to Harvard, Stanford, Berkeley, uh, as an attorney. And she wears hoodies every time she doesn't have to go to court or meet with a client. And needless to say, she's never been stopped. So I'm wondering, if we talk about these kind of things, and, and as I said, I've been stopped for just about every kind of wild, wild black, not wearing a hoodie, living in affluent neighborhoods all my adult life, etc. mostly university communities. So are we buying into stereotypes when we, when we have our kids, rhetorically speaking, shy away from certain styles because they will be supposedly stigmatized. So we bind into those racial stereotypes. Because the very last sentence I'll say, the baggiest clothes I ever saw on anybody with their hat turned around backward was an East Asian UC Berkeley student walking across Broward Plaza. You know, I don't want to stereotype, maybe headed to a microcomputer lab. And uh, I thought, well, you know, wearing baggy clothes and your hat turned backward must be a good thing because he's an East Asian student who got into UC Berkeley. Oh, I said, can I answer this? <laughs> um, so, I mean, I would say um, I don't think that um, 
engaging in these kind of activities on the part of black women is necessarily buying into the stereotype. Um, I think that there's a, and, and I'm, <coughs> one question is how, how, what do you mean by buying into the stereotype? When, when you say that, one of the things I think about is, are we believing it, right? And I would call that a form of internalized racism. But I think that's different than acknowledging that stereotypes exist. Acknowledging and being aware of the fact that stereotypes exist. I think the examples that you gave are classic examples of stereotype threat. Right, stereotype threat that involves one being aware of the stereotypes, the negative stereotypes about your um, social group. Two, being concerned about those stereotypes because some might say I'm aware of it, but I don't care. Right, it doesn't impact anything about me. So one is awareness. Two is being concerned about it. And then three is um, what um, some call confirmation concern. So you're aware of the stereotypes. You're concerned they bother you. But on top of that, you're concerned that your behavior may confirm those stereotypes and reify the presence of those stereotypes in society. And then fourth is avoidance behavior. Is when we do fear confirming these stereotypes, we engage in behaviors to actively avoid, counteract, compensate for, the, the awareness or the existence of those stereotypes. And sometimes it is for ourselves so that we can confirm to ourselves that we're not buying into those stereotypes. But I think often it is to not confirm those stereotypes for others. That said, I think that there are some negative aspects of that in terms of the messages that we give to our children, to ourselves. But I don't think that engaging in those behaviors necessarily means that we're buying into it. I think that we're engaging in performance behavior because of the awareness, the acknowledgement of the existence of those stereotypes. Um, you know, and I can tell you, when I, I've been here for 15 years as a faculty member, and I can tell you, I said to myself, I'm never going to be late to class because I'm not going to promote that color people time stereotype. <laughs> I'm always going to be early. I, unfortunately, I don't feel like I have the luxury to show up for class in shorts and Birkenstocks. I don't have that luxury as a black woman. And so, to be honest, I do perform when I go to class, and that comes down to how I dress, how I carry myself, the words that I speak, but I have to. I, it, it is not because I believe I have to. It's because I have to for everyone else that's looking at me, right? And, and so, you know, I don't believe that that's buying into it, but I think that it's, and I don't even want to say it's necessary in today's society, but I think that, you know, some people engage in that to avoid um, and to probably counteract, to create a different narrative. And I guess I just want to say, as a black male, I have not conformed to those stereotypes in the corporate workplace and in the institution, and I've caught hell all my life and wondered about it. I'm not talking black English. I'm not wearing a hoodie. I'm dressed nicely. I conform to white mannerism. And it's almost like if you're that, the white people who have those, who would have those stereotypes kind of go, like, oh, a smart nigger. We're going to really straighten them out, including from the police. Agreed. Oh, uh, my question is for Dr. Sachs. Um, I was thinking about um, how black women are interacting with their, their physicians. And I know, like, going to an historically black college for undergrad, I have a lot of friends that are black and going through med school, and they've graduated from med school now. And so we always talk about seeking out black doctors as black people. So I was curious how many of the people you spoke to um, were able to successfully like find black doctors and did they feel more support by either black doctors or even just minority doctors? Mm -hmm. That's a great question. That's one of the chapters in the book where I ask women uh, their, about their um, their preferences, they didn't, there, there was just a lot of variation there. They did not overwhelmingly prefer black doctors, and I think part of that is because of the, the availability or lack thereof of black doctors. I think for some people it's not even necessarily a, um, that people even think that they could get a black doctor because there are so many constraints when you add in, is this person, do they take my insurance? Are they on this panel? Are they the kind of subspecialty that I'm looking for? And so you just don't, in some respects, don't even have that many degrees of freedom to try to get, if you need a person on this panel that does X, Y, and Z, to try to get someone who is um, who is also 
um, also black. There were many of the women also described extremely positive relationships they did have with black providers when they were able to get a black provider, however. Um, and one woman in the study that, um, that has led me on this other um, path, whose great grandfather was in the Tuskegee syphilis study and was adamant that she would never be treated by um, a non by a white provider, and because of fear and because of all kinds of other reasons. So she was really the only person that was extremely adamant, and even in an acute healthcare uh, situation with her daughter, would not allow her daughter to be treated. Was there, okay, so we have time for one last question, though. I'm especially, it's for both of you now, and it's a little bit different from Amani's question, but who is your, um, who are you really hoping audience? Oh, sure, sorry. So this question is for both of you. Um, who are you really hoping, as far as intended audience, I'm sure you'd like to reach the broadest, you know, number of people, but, um, you know, we're still gonna, until things change, go to the doctor, and I flex Berkeley and Masters as often as I can, but I have to see a non, you know, POC doctor and things like that. So who are you really hoping um, takes, pays attention to your work, as far as um, the ability to make um, long-lasting and substantial change? Well, I um, short answer to everyone. <laughs> um, uh, I guess the longer answer is that because the book is sort of divided into these two sections, one that's focused on parenting and the concerns that mothers have, then I, I really do want you know educational institutions and teachers and the trainers of teachers to uh, read the book and get a sense of the kinds of concerns. I would want law enforcement to read the books. You know, I would love for the um, uh, Hollywood main like media industry to read the book. I mean, we had a lot of a lot of evidence that positive black imagery sells pretty well, and um, you know, uh, movies that feature black people um, who were middle class who are talking like other black people I know who were middle class. Um, do well, right? So in that, in that sense, I would love to have that happen. In, this, in the second half of the book where I talk more about issues related to family and work, I think that there's something to be learned by, by looking at the, the, the looking at black middle class moms that can help think about um, work family conflict in general. So clearly we live in a society that does, does, does not support working parents. Um, we can do a lot in terms of structural and policy changes to help support parents. But I also think that we need to look at our culture around how we think about working, mothers in particular. Um, and one of the things I would say uh, was a con sort of consistent thing in my, in my um, interviews with moms, th that they felt supported in the decisions that they made to, to work outside of the home. And having that kind of cultural support, um, and I would say that on the, on the flip side, the fact that some didn't feel supported in their decisions to stay at home is something that we can change, but I think it highlights the fact that the kinds of conflicts we have in society are made, and we can unmake them. We can think about what sorts of elements about the ways that black women are supported by their families and in terms of not being stigmatized when they make the decision to work outside of their home. And I didn't say this before, but you know, one of the reasons why black women also felt stigmatized or more concerned about staying at home is that they were often assumed to be on welfare. So they would have to do a lot of flexing of their middle class status to do so. So thinking about ways that we can sort of have cultural shifts um, as well as structural ones, because we need both of them to support um, families. I hope, I mean, like Don, I hope that, that this book will resonate with many people. I think the, the group that I hope res that it resonates with the most is actually black women. Um, and secondarily to that other, to healthcare providers writ large, um, for people to really understand that these kinds of you know, both that we need both structural and cultural change to really address this, and that these these experiences have their they they can cause material harms. They're not just sort of this like intrapsychic um, feeling of malaise, but they have real consequences to people's lives, and that those consequences should be recognized um, by the broader society. So one of the things that will help. Um, Tina and Don get their messages out to these broader audiences is for each person in the audience to order their books and to talk about this work 
to give it as a birthday gift, as some kind of gift to celebrate this work by engaging in these kinds of conversations so that this is not just a talk that we have within the walls of UC Berkeley, but these are conversations that people are having around their dinner tables at night, that they're talking to their children and their partners with, and, and with their providers, et cetera. So again, I just want to um, invite you all to order or purchase the books outside. Again, you can get a signed copy of Dr. Sack's book today, but you can also order a copy of either of the books, um, and Dr. Dow's book can be um, sent to you. So I encourage everyone to do that. And please join me in thanking Dr. Dow. <laughs> sponsors and co-sponsors for putting this event on. Thank all of you for taking time out of your day to come here. And I would also like to invite you to stay for the reception in the back of the hall where you'll get a chance to talk amongst one another, but also greet and talk more with our speakers for the day. Do you have any final words? Um, also, we wanted to thank Deborah Lustig and Takiya Franklin and Erica Brown and any of the other uh, staff that made this event possible. Thank you so much.